Hey everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Chris Jager. I am the fiction book buyer here at Baker Book House in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I don't know where you guys are all joining us from, but I've heard messages from all different places. And so whatever time zone you are in and whichever part of the world, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is my privilege to interview a person I call a friend. Um, Jocelyn Green has written numerous books, and she will tell us how many, I'm sure. I, I never dare to add, uh, say because I'm always afraid I'll get it wrong. And I have enjoyed every one of them. Um, she writes very well-researched historical fiction um, that is just a pleasure to read. So um, we are going to have some question and answer time, so make sure you send in your questions and um the two ladies that are helping me tonight will make sure I get them. And so we will ask as many questions as we can. And welcome, Jocelyn. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. The social highlight of my week, for sure. <laughs> is that sad? But I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> Sorry, that just struck me as so funny. So I know, um, I, I know. I have to admit, though, I, I'm probably with you on that one. So... Um, <laughs> But at least this is like an actual event. It's not like when I took my cat to the vet this afternoon and like, yay, another person. This is, you know, this is legit exciting. I know. I'm sure the people at the grocery stores are really sick of talking to people because it's like, yay, I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> right. So anyways, so um, thank you again for joining us. I have been looking forward to this since we set the date. So um, you know, and you, you had mentioned earlier when we were conversing and such that um, you had been in the store a couple times. So um, we were glad that you could join us this way, too. Um, you know, I was not that far away, but it's far enough. So, but let's get started. Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, uh, Shadows in the White City or of the White City. I keep doing that. Sorry about that. Um, and you can include like Veiled in Smoke because those two go together right. quite well. So. Sure. Well, yes, I think I'll have to. So <laughs> Veiled in Smoke, let's see if I can get this right, takes place in 1871 during the Great Chicago Fire, and it focuses on the Townsend family, two oh. sisters, Meg and Sylvie. Uh, they own a bookstore. Meg is the person in Veiled in Smoke who really gets the spotlight. And then in Shadows of the White City, wah, it's her sister, Sylvie. Um, that we get to hear her story. But 22 years pass between Veiled in Smoke and Shadows of the White City. So when we open the story in book two, we see Sylvie again. She's 43 years old, still single. She's running the bookshop, and she's a part-time tour guide at the World's Fair of 1893 in Chicago as well. She has taken in a Polish immigrant child years before the story opens up. And then she's 17 years old. Her name is Rose. And she goes missing at the World's Fair. So that's really the inciting incident. And Sylvie goes through a lot of uh, internal reflection as she's trying to find Rose. She's also going through Rose's diaries, looking for clues and discovering, gosh, maybe I didn't know her struggle as well as I thought I did. And she finds out that Rose has really been very interested in finding her Polish roots and her biological family. Even though both of her parents had died, she was hoping to make a connection with possibly some relatives who had come from Poland to the World's Fair, as people did come from all over the world. So that's the, the premise of Shadows of the White City. That's perfect. So it makes me want to read it all over again now that <laughs> I've got... Some of that stuff, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, and I'm going to wander off here, and history always fascinates me, so I always apologize to those listening when I'm suddenly indulging myself here. The Chicago World's Fair is one of those things that a lot of people write about. Just They just do. Um, what attracted you to that setting? Um, Chicago, even in general, because you did the, the Great Fire first. Um, right. Well, to answer that question, it would be easiest if I just explain my thoughts going into planning a three book series all set in Chicago. Um, I wanted to 
focus on the city of Chicago and wrap three different stories around three different major events that took place in the city. And it just so happened that the Great Fire, the World's Fair, and the Eastland disaster, which will be the focus of book three, and we'll talk about that later, they're, they're spread out about 22 years in between each one. And we were trying to think of how could we connect the series and we came up with this family. So we meet the patriarch in book one and the daughters. And then of course, Sylvie gets her story in book two. And then in book three, will the focus or the protagonist will be Olive, who is Meg's daughter. So I really just wanted to hang these stories on these seminal events in Chicago's history. You asked about the World's Fair in particular, what attracted me to that? I am attracted to times of great change, which is why I've written so much about wars in the past. Uh, and actually, Shadows of the White City is the first book that has nothing to do with a war. Um, even Veiled in Smoke had a little bit because Stephen, the father, was a Civil War veteran. He had what they called soldier's heart from his time at the Andersonville um, prison camp, but this one has nothing to do with war, but it's still a, a time of great change. And you had the celebration of inventions and achievements from the previous century in this amazing uh, spectacle of a city. They call it the white city because all the buildings were made to look like white marble. But outside of the white city, the country was going through a national depression. Banks were closing. Railroads were going bankrupt. Immigrant conditions on the other side of town were pretty bad. And that fascinates me, too, how we can have the, the very um, the most dazzling spectacle in one half of the city and, um, you know, the seedier side on the other. And, and we get to see both as Sylvie is going around and searching for Rose in, in all angles of the city. Yeah, and I really like that you brought that out a lot where you have the two contrasts um, between, well, rich and poor. I, you know, how else do you put it? So um, I think that's what I like about your history books is you do that research to make sure that gets included. Um, and it shows in your writing. So, um, so thank you for that. So I do have a question already. Um, um, somebody would like to know, where do you get your inspiration? I get my inspiration Anywhere I can. <laughs> I really, you guys would be surprised if you knew how many bad ideas I go through to get to a good idea. But I watch documentaries. Whenever we go traveling, we will stop at the side of the road and look at the historical marker. When we go to museums, we read Actually, we don't even read everything. We just take pictures of all the little captions on the wall, and then we go through and read everything later. I read a fair amount of nonfiction. Um, by the way, this reminds me, if some of you are familiar with the book The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson, that is the nonfiction book about the World's Fair of 1893, and it talks a lot about um, building it and the drama uh, that the architects had, and it talks about H.H. H. Holmes. America's first serial killer who was picking girls off at the fair. There is no serial killer in my book. We, I just didn't want to go there. So if any of you are wondering, oh, we're going to have a little H.H. H. Holmes action here. No, we are not. Didn't want to go there. That's too dark for me. Um, but if you want that, go read Eric Larson's book. Um, so but we were talking about inspiration. Yeah, I look everywhere. I look everywhere. And if I can come up with some kind of idea, I rejoice greatly. Where is then, what is the, the place where you'd say, oh, that is probably a really strange place that I got an idea for the book? Uh, yes. My brother and sister-in-law were living in France. Uh, they were working with Crew, which was formerly Campus Crusade for Christ. Yep. And they had gone on vacation to the town called La Rochelle. That's with my American accent. I can't <laughs> speak French. Uh, but they came back and they told me this amazing story about the king's daughters, which were uh, orphans, French orphans, who were sent over to Canada to be the wives of trappers and fur traders in the, I think that was in the 1600s. 
And they told me this thinking, hey, would you like to write about that? And I thought, hey, yes, I would. But then I thought, I wonder if an American publisher would mind a story that's not set in America. Now, I have actually written a story set fully in Canada since then. That was between two shores. But I just started Googling and I started searching, searching, searching. And one click leads to another, as you know. I went down all the rabbit holes, and by the time I came out, I had discovered that in the 1720s, the French government decided to clean out many jails by sending uh, convicts to New Orleans. So there I had my American setting, and that little kernel that my brother and sister-in-law shared with me about their vacation grew into the mark of the king, which people seemed to like a lot. So, hooray. Yes, and we're happy of that. Um, I see a whole bunch of them on the Zoom thing, so we'll catch up with them. I do have a couple written down. So, um, okay. are you going to write any more books on the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, or the War of 1812? <laughs> Great ideas. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I would love to write more on all of those. Um, I... Recently, one of the things that I decided to do um, during the past year was look into becoming a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution Society, because I had heard that I could qualify as just a matter of getting your documentation. Well, just last month, I was inducted. So now I'm like, you know, I'm a DAR, so I feel like I should write something set in the American Revolution. I haven't yet. You probably know that my the closest one to the American Revolution would be a refuge assured, which takes place a decade afterwards. But I'm, I'm all for it. It all the wars. I'm still interested. I still am. Are you going to write anything younger, like World Wars or Vietnam or Korea? Who can say? <laughs> Who can say? But I, I never thought I would write fiction when I wrote nonfiction, and then I thought I will never write in the 20th century. And right now I'm writing a book set in the year 1915. So who knows? I really like to go all over the place. Yeah, I guess that's all I'll say for now. Okay. <laughs> and just a hint on book three, if anybody was paying attention. So <laughs> let's see, how long does it take to do so much research on history and then interweaving the story? Does that make sense to you? I'm reading it word for word. I can hold yep. it up. You know what? I'm just going to start talking. Okay. And I think I will probably end up answering something. <laughs> that was the best answer ever. <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is really showing you like how very little, how few public events I have done this year. Anyway, um, I do spend a lot of time researching. It used to be, for example, with my First novel, Wedded to War, I spent nine months researching before I started writing. And then it took me three months to write the rough draft. And as I write a rough draft, I'll find holes in my research that I have to go back and fill in. Um, I have not been able to spend nine months on solely research since then because once you have a book that is out, then you have to market and promote while you're writing the next book. So, um, but I would still say I spend a good um, maybe five months or so researching before I write. And that, but the research doesn't really end until the book goes to print because there's always little things to fact check and, and holes to fill in. Awesome. And then somebody wants to know, um, how did you become interested in historical fiction? It sounds like you were probably a little bit of a history buff for a while. Does it? A little bit. Am <laughs> I wrong? <laughs> no. I, you know, as I try to think back to school, I wish that I had majored in history, but apparently that just wasn't on my radar. I'll tell you when it started becoming really interesting to me. When I was writing, wait. Okay, I have a visual aid. Look at how big this is. Oh. So this is nonfiction. This is called Stories of Faith and Courage from the Home Front. I co-authored it with Karen Whiting. It's 365 days worth of stories 
from all of the wars from the French and Indian War up through the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, as we were dividing up which wars we were going to cover, I requested the Civil War. And that led me to go to Gettysburg physically and go into the Adams County Historical Society. And it was there when I was reading through these binders of women's diaries and women's letters and things that had not been published. Um, th because they weren't written for publication, they were full of emotion and they were completely dramatic. And I remember thinking, this would make a great novel. Somebody should write a novel based on this. And then um, a couple weeks later, my nonfiction publisher, uh, one of them, I've had a few different ones, but it was Moody Publishers, suggested historical fiction for me and something related to the military. So I said, let me tell you what I just learned. <laughs> and they said, give us a proposal. And so that's how the Heroines Behind the Line Civil War series was born. And I just haven't really looked back. Yeah, and it's a perfect fit. So um, I'm, like I said, I'm always glad. Um, Somebody here wanted to know if you studied old photos and architectural plans of Chicago for an impression of the city back then. Yes, I did. And <laughs> um, <laughs> did I make you nervous, Chris? Did you think that was going to be the, the end next of that? question? Yet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So one of the things that I did, because there's a lot of printed material on both the Great Fire and the World's Fair. So I could do a lot of research from right here. The comfort of my own home but I always like to go to the location not only because there's the the historical society in Chicago and the Newberry Library um, and I can look at microfilm and old photographs with the little gloves on and all the fancy stuff but I also have connected with <laughs> you're cracking up I'm so sorry mm -hmm. okay <laughs> all right man now I feel like we're giggling in church and we're yes. not supposed to be all right, so I, I do want to tell you about my tour guide, Kevin. He owns a tour guide company called Wild Onion Walks, and I told him what I was doing, and I sent him the synopsis for my novels, what I knew at the time, and I said, if I come to Chicago, can you, can you like, show me around? Like, whatever of this stuff is still standing, can you show me around? And he did, so I've been able to take three trips to Chicago so far, Two of them involved tours by Kevin. Um, and, you know, for the 1871 book, a lot of the stuff burned in the fire, of course. But he was able to say, but if you go to this Dressler House Museum, um, you can get an idea of how the wealthy lived in that time period. And he also handed me, I'm prepared, see, he handed me maps of... <sighs> different places in Chicago and this is like the the wickedest place in the USA that's what this says and it has little names of like the flop hotel bed bug alley so you might recognize some places in the novel so he was extremely helpful so awesome. that's one reason why I like to go to the place I think you should write a book about Grand Rapids so you would have to go there Oh, I have so many reasons to visit Grand Rapids. <laughs> oh, we're getting a pile here. We should. Okay, I'll try to. I'll try to be more concise. Okay, somebody wants to know if you could talk about how your husband did the map in the front of the book. Sure. Okay. So I'll. Sh I was able to find an original map from a Rand McNally tour guide Ooh. of the World's Fair. It's just on Google Books. So if you go to books.google.com and you type it in, you can find this huge map. Um, and he just, I told him what was important out of it. And so he made it and he simplified it. And I don't know if you can see kind of like that. Yeah. And uh, he's just very good at it. He loves maps. He used to do um, maps for the Coast Guard. He was in the Coast Guard for a while. Oh, that's interesting. See, that makes it, and isn't he mayor? I love that. So. <laughs> Thought I'd just give him a plug there. So. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know this was a question we talked about too. Um, what research do you do to get the dialogue right for that time period? And the yes. various ones. 
Yeah, that is a good question. I read, I try to read books that were written during that period. Well, that's um, interesting. For instance, or, or written a long time ago about that period. So for when I was writing Between Two Shores, which is set in 1759, I read The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, which has, you know, there are some similarities, but here, here's where you have to be careful as an author. I found that it affected my dialogue a little too much. Like it made it sound a little too old fashioned. And so even if it was correct to the time, my editor was pointing out, readers are gonna stumble over this. This doesn't make sense anymore. So you have to be careful to not use words that weren't around in that time period, but also not make it so old fashioned that readers are just gonna be confused about it. Awesome. Okay, so somebody wants to know, what does a day look like when you write? And do you write daily? And how long does it take you to write a book? Now I can repeat those as we want I got it, I got okay. it. All right, it's not very interesting. You're not gonna like this answer. But um, when I wanna get serious about writing, I put on my writing pants, which are, usually I'm writing in the winter. So these are flannel pajama pants, usually from L.L. Bean. They're usually plaid. In fact, I'm wearing a pair right now. They don't match what you see up here. Um, and I, I try to get working by 11 a.m. The morning, I help my kids with whatever they need help with. They're 12 and 14. We homeschool. They're quite independent, but the mornings are for them. If I can't get started by 11, I usually can get started by 1. And then I, I write until I have to start making dinner. And um, when I'm on a deadline, a writing a rough draft, I try to write five days a week. It doesn't always happen. And um, that would be for maybe three months. It takes me about three months to crank out a rough draft. And what did I miss? Do you write daily? I had a no, <laughs> no, no okay. I don't. Don't ever let someone tell you that if you don't write every day, you're not a writer or that you don't want it badly enough. That's baloney. I need a break. I just turned a rough draft in and I'm reading like a banshee. Banshees read a lot. If you didn't know. That? Yeah. Sorry, I had no idea. We'll, we'll have to discuss it sometime. Oh, oh, here's an interesting question. Did you know the time period of all three books when you started the first one of the series that you yes. knew they were going to be, what is it, 20, 30 years apart? Too? Yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. We had we had that all planned out and we had to figure out how to connect all three books with which family members. So okay. we did plan that. Okay. And then somebody wants to know, can you give us a little sneak peek into Olive's story? Sorry, I was going to say Olivia. That's not right. It's Olive, um, which I assume is book number three. Yes, it is book number three. Sure. The inciting incident for book number three is a little known tragedy in Chicago called the Eastland Disaster. The Eastland was the name of a steamship that was in the Chicago River. It had just been boarded by 2,500 employees of the Western Electric factory plant, and the ship tipped over in the river. It just tipped over, and because it was raining, a lot of folks had gone to the below decks to get out of the rain, and they were trapped. And they were only, they were, the ship was still tied up to the dock when it tipped over and 844 people lost their lives. So my character, Olive, is, she works for MetLife, Metropolitan Life Insurance. And she's on the ship when it happens so that you all can see what that was like. She and her friend. And then her job is, um, you know, she has to work with a lot of clients who's, who had lost loved ones on the ship. And I don't know how much I'm allowed to tell you right now, so let that be enough. That's good. That's good. That whets, that whets our appetite. So, And there are some people still reading. Um, actually, i seen somebody that was saying they had um, just started Veiled in Smoke. So they're still reading one and two. So. Okay. Um, I don't think I've spoiled anything yet, and I will try not to. I don't, I don't think so. I think you um, have done, you know. Weather appetite is a good word for it. Okay, so. good. Oh, somebody wants to know, do you have a favorite book that you have written? No, <laughs> that is like choosing a favorite child. And I actually have been asked this enough times. And every time I search my soul and I say, do I have a favorite? 
And I have to say, no, I have, you know, like I, if you want a book that is not going to be super graphic and take you onto the battlefield, and if you don't want to learn how to do an amputation, then maybe this is the book for you, Shadows of the White City. Um, if you want one set in the French and Indian War with a character who's half French and half Mohawk, that's between two shorts. So it just depends on on the mood that you're in. Yeah. And is it your favorite while you're working on it at all? Or no, oh, my gosh. It's my least favorite when I'm working <laughs> on it. Are you kidding? Oh, man. Ugh. I hate, I hate the rough draft stage because the whole time you're working on the rough draft, well, at least for me, I'm thinking, I don't know if this is going to come together. And I'm also comparing that rough draft to the book that's about to release, which is all polished and shiny and ready to go. And I'm writing this and I'm like, this will be a disappointment. But, but, you know, that's just part of the writer cycle and we get over it because there's a beautiful thing called revisions. Thank goodness for those. I, I agree with that. So yeah. um, we're going to change topics just a little bit for you. Um, we're going to get off the history questions. We do have a few more, and we'll get to those in a little bit. But somebody wants to know what you are reading now. And I would like to know what else you're excited about what's coming. Great. So. All right. Well, you've caught me between books because I have been reading a lot. I will just show you. I just finished When Twilight Breaks by Sarah Sundin. Can I just tell you all something? There's a lot of World War II fiction out there. And, yeah. and you see another title that's World War II, and you think, well, what, what is this going to bring to me that I haven't already? But then you pick up a book like this, and I read it in three days. Wow. And it was beautiful. And here's another one. The Paris Dressmaker by Christy Cambron, also a World War II book. Um, this one is set in Munich, Germany. And this one is set in Paris, France. Um, and they are both unique angles that I was very excited about. So you asked me what I'm reading right now. I'm between. Like, I just finished a bunch of books. I also just finished this week The Orchard House by Heidi Schiavaroli, if I'm saying that correctly. If you love Louisa May Alcott and time slip fiction, pick this one up. You will not be disappointed. Also, Tidewater Bride by Laura France. I love this author so much that I decided that I must have all of her books in paperback, which meant that I recently had to go to thriftbooks.com and order a very good copy of Courting Marl Little from the UK because I couldn't find it anywhere, anywhere. Mm -hmm. All right. So those are books that I've read recently that I'm excited about. You want to know what I'm going to read next? Here's my pile. The Right Kind of Fool. Did you love this, Chris? Did you read this? I don't want to put you on the spot. Never mind. Um, <laughs> and thank you for not making that awkward at all. But no, I love Sarah's writing. She's very good too. Okay. So I'm sorry. I took that down so quickly. It was this one. Um, also, I'm really excited about Till I Want No More by Robin W. Pearson. I'm really excited. And it's a nice, thick book. And I love thick books. And the last one the I'm going to share one? with you. What's did that? Did you read the first one? Yes, I did. I, on I did. And I'm glad that I can say that. And I'm so glad that it won the Christie Award. And I'm just expecting more wonderful things from Robin. Yep. The Nature of Fragile Things by Susan Meisner, 1906 San Francisco Earthquake. Hey, guess what? Somebody, maybe one of you, once suggested that I write about the San Francisco earthquake. Guess what? Already done. And it's probably amazing. It is. Right here. You're going to love it. He knows. Okay. Yep. That's it. Okay. So awesome. And those are all good books. Um, I would like, well, actually I've done most of them, but we can't read them all. We try. I know. Um, oh, somebody wants to know, do you have a title for that third book yet? Yes. Guess what? I don't have permission to share it with you yet. Okay. So it's a big secret and you'll have to storm. No, don't do that. Never mind. Don't. No, don't. You can <laughs> <laughs> Oops, <laughs> let me take my foot out of my mouth and then we'll move. <laughs> don't come storming over here. No, don't. That's bad. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> here's a great question. How did you learn how to do amputations? The same way the doctors on the battlefield learned it. I found the book. I seriously, oh. I seriously found 
the exact textbook that they used. I thought you were going to say you did one. <laughs> no. Oh, no. I read, I went so far as to read the textbook, but I did not go so far as to get busy with my saw. But I mean, I went to the, oh, it's in Fredericksburg, Maryland. It's the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I can't believe I remember this stuff. It must have made an impression on me. But I was able to look at the textbooks and I, I was so impressed that I found this material that if you think what I put in those books is graphic, you should have seen it before the edits. I mean, man, I probably could have, you know, reined it in a little bit more than I did. But, uh, yeah. It's like being there, sort of. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Ooh. I, you know what? This is a dangerous question. If you don't want to answer it, please say so. What are some of your favorite books written by other authors? I just shared them. Okay. And that's all I will say. Okay. I no seriously you guys I read I try to read quite a bit and I love so many books if you would like to keep up with those books you could follow my reviews on Goodreads or on Instagram because there are so many that I can't just like if I start naming even more I'll feel bad for leaving others out but thank you for being interested in what I like <laughs> yeah. okay when creating characters do you construct fictional ancestries for perspective on the current book or do you just kind of like oh there they are at such and such an age i do sometimes create fictional ancestries yes i do <laughs> okay and sometimes it matters in books more than others and sometimes it comes out in fact in a refuge assured there is ancestor of my main character that is also an ancestor of Laura France's main character in The Lace Maker. So I, got, so I had written this book about a lace maker from France, and then I got her author newsletter, and she's talking about her upcoming book, The Lace Maker. And at first I was like, oh, no. And then I thought, ooh, let's make them relatives. So that's, that's one thing that we did. That's fun. Um, somebody quick wants you to mention, what was the first book you mentioned before um, the Paris Dressmaker? Oh, um, okay. That one was London, wasn't it? When Twilight Breaks. And I saw another comment pop up that said about the San Francisco earthquake. That's The Nature of Fragile Things by Susan Meisner. There we go. Everybody's caught up, I think. Otherwise, ask again. I know she will. Um, oh, somebody wants to know, how do you pick a title? Do you do don't it? I you guys I am terrible at titles so my my editors and my marketing people at the publisher are so kind they ask me every time what kind of a title are you thinking and I throw out some garbage and they come up with a great title but I will say so Yes, it does feel like I give them garbage, but I do like one of the things I do is I give them a list of words that might help them come up with something. And I also give them some words that I don't want to see just in case they were going to go that direction. <laughs> and I know that quite often your titles somewhere reveal themselves in your book. Is that something that they just happen to be really good at or is that something you add after the title of the book? I add that after I have a title for the book. So right now I have already, wait, no, I, but I knew the title. I, I didn't find out the title for book three until a few weeks before the deadline. But the, so then I was able to work it in to the last chapter and I might change it. There's lots of time, but yeah, that comes after. When is that book scheduled to release? February, the, probably the first Tuesday of February next year, 2022. Mark your calendars. We'll all be yeah. here waiting for it to arrive in the store. <laughs> Somebody wants to know if you get to choose who narrates your audiobooks. I usually not, which is fine because the companies that do that have been choosing wonderful narrators. I am independently producing my Civil War titles as audiobooks. And so, but even there, um, Moody Publishers had already selected Laura Rich Creek to narrate Widow of Gettysburg, but they only decided to do an audiobook for for one of the Civil War books. And I felt like other people wanted 
the other ones. So I just asked Laura if she would do the other ones as well, because she's doing a great job. If I really wanted to try to audition other narrators, I could do that, but there was no need. And that's interesting too, because that audio or the additional pro audition pro you know, process takes a bit in audio. So, so that's kind of cool that you can do that. Um, somebody wants to know, how did you get into writing and do you have any tips for new authors? I have been writing stories ever since I could hold a pencil. I mean, even when I had a, I had a coloring book that was Bugs Bunny and I was writing captions to turn it oh. into a story. Uh, I went to college to get a degree in English, which I was told was a useless degree. And I had minors in mass common PR so that I could, you know, do something in a company. And I did that. I worked at the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities for a while. And then um, I married an officer in the Coast Guard and we moved from Washington, D.C. to Alaska. So I was no longer employed by that nonprofit and decided to start doing freelance writing. So I was a freelance journalist for several years. And then I started doing the nonfiction um, for military because that was my experience as a military wife. And then that led into kind of a military angle for fiction. You asked... Um, What's my advice for people who want to write? I would say, read, 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 work on the craft, buy books about, about the writing craft, go to conferences, find good ones, breathe Christian Writers Conference or Breathe Writers Conference in Grand Rapids is a great one. And if you want to go to my website, jocelyngreen.com, I have a tab at the top that says for writers or on writing. That's all my best advice. So go there. You'll be fine. And, okay, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> um, oh, and, okay, this question actually made me giggle, and you were talking about something serious, and I was giggling, so sorry about that. But okay. somebody would like to marry Kristoff, and if oh. he says no, can they marry Harrison Caldwell instead? Is this Rachel McMillan? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sure. You can go ahead, Rachel. That'll be fine. If, if that is Rachel. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about people I made up. You know, and I'm sure it says whoever got it to me, but I don't get to know who asked the question. Let's so go I'll have to just guess there. Well, I thought you were giggling because you saw a different question. And can I mention it? Because I, I saw it pop up and it's from my mother. So, <gasps> mom, great job. I'm glad you're watching. It's Pixie Falk, by the way. She said, what do you do with a character in the plot if they're no longer helpful or useful? They're out of there. I kill them off. Either they die of some disease or I send them on a trip. If they're not pulling their weights, forget it. I can't, I can't, can't deal with that. So they're just watering down the, the pages. So you're one of those authors that always kills off my favorite character, aren't you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm not. Readers, don't worry. I'm not. She's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's an interesting question, and it might require a little bit of background um, to it. So I'm going to ask the question, and then you and I can maybe piece it together before you answer it. Um, I noticed there was a new cover from when Shadows in the White City was in the um, Baker House Publishing Group's catalog. Why the change? So... The Baker Bookhouse catalog is something that um, salespeople get, and it comes. It does show up online once in a while too that people get it. Um, it's not always the final. So, so why the change? Okay, because I requested some changes. <laughs> Normally, they send me the cover, and and I just basically say that's great. Because they, they give me an opportunity before they design the cover to give all kinds of input. And I, I did that, but I did request some changes. Um, one of the things, well, I didn't like the way her dress was fitting her in, in, the, in the picture, in the catalog. Um, and I also just ooh, I didn't like the dress. I also thought that because veiled in smoke, you see a person from the back and you see the full, you know, it's kind of like this. I thought maybe that would be good to carry through with the next book. Um, so, so to be fair, when I requested some changes, 
Um, it was kind of too late. It had already gone to print in the catalog, but the people that I worked with were very kind and they had all, they already had this cover. This was one of the mock mock-ups, um, the choices. And I loved it because it's, this is hard with the lighting, but the, it, it goes into this white behind the title, which fits in with the title white city and veiled in smoke also like has this solid creamy white. So I'm very pleased with the final and that's what happened. Yeah. And just in true confession time, so to speak, it probably happens more often than we know. Um, yeah. It's not something that I normally talk about. Yeah, and it's very rare that a, a cover comes out like that and then gets changed after. That's rare, but covers get changed all the time. So, um, oh, here's a good question. Who is in your writing support group? Can you share that or is it a secret group? No, it's not a secret. Susie Finkbeiner is my best writing buddy and just dear friend in general. We talk through Marco Polo, the little video app, every day. And it's so great that we don't have books coming out at the same time of year. Because when I'm going through my, this is a terrible book stage, she's not in that stage. And she's able to be like, now, now, Joss, that's the writerly angst that we can expect at this part, stage in the cycle. And you know that you're going to come out of it. And then when she's in that stage, like, this is a boring book. I've read it a million times. People aren't going to like it. Then I could be like, now, now, Suze. So it's really a, what do we call that? A symbiotic relationship? I think so. That's <laughs> awesome. And I could, that's exactly what you two sound like. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, what did you learn about yourself or what developed in your faith journey as you write, have wrote and are writing this Chicago series? Kind of an interesting and very deep question. That's a very deep question. I'm going to limit it to what I learned and thought about during the writing of Shadows of the White City, okay? Because otherwise, we will be here much longer. <laughs> um, uh, Sylvie is dealing with raising and understanding and being sensitive to a teenage daughter. I also and raising and trying to be sensitive to a teenage daughter. My daughter is not adopted. She's my biological child. She's 14 instead of 17. She's, you know, she does not have the same issues that this fictional teenage daughter has. But Sylvie has issues of wanting to control things because she wants the outcome to be good. And I think a lot of us as parents can relate to that. Like how much do we control for our children? Because we're afraid that if we don't, things will fall apart. And like, when do we let them make the mistakes that they need to make so that they can learn at this smaller scale so they don't have to learn on the huge scale after they move out? So, um, and another big lesson that Sylvie had to learn in Shadows of the White City is that we can, let me see, how do I phrase this? She says something in the book like, I, I trust God, I trust his ability, but sometimes I struggle to trust his timing. And I think we could probably all say that that's true in our own lives at one point or another. Like, yes, we know that God can heal, but will he? And will he do it before it gets worse? Will he do this thing for me? before, you know, something really terrible happens. And just learning to trust God, even when we can't see his behind the scenes orchestration. That's, I think it's going to be a, something that we work on for the rest of our lives. It's not something that we're like, well, got it. I'm good now. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody wants to know if you had a family that was really into reading. Um, did you have a lot of books in your home? Yes, awesome. I did. My mom is here. So she would, you know, she would probably comment if I said otherwise, but my mom has always been a huge reader and she reads very widely too, fiction, nonfiction. I mean, she reads Solzhenitsyn and James Harriet and, and fiction and like, she's very well read and we did grow up surrounded by books and that has been a great legacy. Do you have any favorite childhood books that you have encouraged your children to read? 
Well, if by encouraged, do you mean I forced them to listen while I read the entire Laura Ingalls Wilder series out loud to them? Then yes. <laughs> That's oh. what I meant. Yep, that was it. <laughs> I thought so. No, I mean, I love those books growing up and we did read those out loud. The first book to the last, I think my kids actually enjoyed it. And we took a trip out to South Dakota um, to the Black Hills and Custer State Park. And on our way back, we stopped at the, the Ingalls Homestead and we spent a day there and um, they, they did enjoy it. I have not gotten my daughter into the Anne of Green Gables books. Do you know? But they do enjoy the Narnia books. So that's good. And um, Lord of the Rings. You know how they say that the, the um, book is always better than the movie? Well, I don't know. When it comes to the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, the but, movies are a little more fast-paced than the books. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have done audio of them, the the actual long edition of them. Right. And listening to that and the word descriptions is really good. Yeah. Um, it's different than reading it yet. So, but yeah, that's hard. I still actually, to be honest with you, reading-wise, I like The Hobbit better than The Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings um movie wise i like all of them but mm -hmm. yeah but it's just you know different tastes so right. <laughs> um this could be a yes or no answer i won't be prepared okay. um have you ever thought of writing a children's book yes i have especially because every time i express any degree of stress as a writer my children are always quick to say when are you gonna write children's books that wouldn't be as stressful but it's a whole it's a whole other genre, and I, I am not opposed to exploring that in the future, but it would be a really steep learning curve for me. I do like the idea. I like lots of ideas. It's kind of a problem for me. <laughs> no, that's not a problem. We are, we're all fine with it. Okay. Uh, would you be interested in like like a picture book, or would you be like an age group, like well, like the Little House on the Prairie books or the Narnia books? I would say because my children are, you know, they read chapter books, I would say probably for, you know, eight to 12 year olds. But when I was little, I thought I was going to be an author. I called it an Arthur. When I grew up, I'm going to be an Arthur. And I always thought I was going to write children's books. That was the thing. And that is the one thing I have not done. Well, I mean, there's lots of things I haven't done. I also don't do sports. Um, but children's books, I haven't, I haven't done there. Oh, well, maybe your publisher is listening. So, you know, maybe. So. <laughs> I don't know if they do children's books. Have you? <laughs> we're going to move on from there. <laughs> Have you ever considered your books turning your books into a television series? And then they give the examples of Bright Brighterton <laughs> and The Outlander, and it, oh. I didn't see either one of your books going that way. But okay. <laughs> I, you know what, I like the idea of, well, no, it's not up to me. I'll just put it that way. I mean, I, I have not taken a single class on how to turn a novel into a movie script or a TV script. I know those are out there and I could pursue that. It's not something I want to invest my time into. If somebody wanted to turn one of my books into a movie, I would be so flattered by that. But I would also consider what happened with Charles Martin and The Mountain Between Us as a cautionary tale that when you sign over your rights to the book, you have to be willing for the television or the movie producers to make changes to it that you don't get to say whether or not you approve of. So I don't have any gratuitous sex or profanity in my books. No, you don't. But if they turn it into a movie or a television series, could they put that in there? Yeah, they could. So it's not a priority for me. Okay. Um, let's see. I have a couple more here. I just want to make sure I didn't ask them to you. Oh, I did ask that once. So. Let's see. If you were going to write in a different genre than historical, what would you write? And that doesn't include kids' books because we've now covered that. What? That was my answer. I was going to say kids' books. Yeah. Okay, next question. <laughs> yep, moving right along. So of all the different time periods you've written in, which one is your favorite? 
again, it's like choosing children. There are different things about different centuries that I love. I will say that now that I've just turned in a book written, um, I mean, set in 1915, I have been very pleased at how easy the research has been. And my vocabulary has expanded. For instance, I got very excited on my Facebook page that for the first time in all of these books, I can use the word adrenaline because that word came into use in like 1905 or 1906. And now I'm writing in 1915. I couldn't use, so I had to say things like energy course through her veins, energy course through her veins, really. I'm trying to get you to think about adrenaline, but I can't, it's like taboo. You know that game? It's kind of old now. But, um, and the research has been so much easier. And I like that about it. Um, I still really enjoyed writing The Mark of the King, which was set in French colonial New Orleans in 1720 something, but that was hard to research. What was I thinking? I mean, the primary sources were in French. I don't speak French. <laughs> I mean, a lot of them had been translated into English and my sister-in-law graciously did translate some for me, but um, yeah, there are different things that I like about different time periods. It sounds like I'm not willing to commit to an answer, but that's just the truth. I like a lot. Yeah. And you know what? I think that shows in your writing too, because oh, you do, well, write in a lot of different genres, not genres, in time periods, but they're all interesting. You know, yeah. I, and that to me is good writing because it's like writing in different genres, because like you said, you have to do the research and you can't say, well, what happened in 1700 New Orleans, I'm going to use in this book that I wrote in 1915 so well you didn't exactly. write it in 1915. it's set in 1950 mm -hmm. you're a lot older than you look if you wrote it in 1915 yes <laughs> yeah no um I, here's a question for you do you work on more than one book at a time yes not in the same day usually but you kind of have to because <laughs> um it, while my editors have the book i should be working on research for the next book and then when the editors give me my memo and after we have a conversation about how to change it then I'll spend a couple of months rewriting book three and then they'll have it for a while and I need to be working on the other book and also while I'm writing I have to take time out from that to do edits on the previous book write the current book and probably try to come up with an idea for the next book. Like it's all, it's all together. So then that leads well to this question. How do you learn how, you know, with the different periods, how do you switch from one culture to the next and then back again? Do you ever find yourself forgetting which <laughs> time period you're supposed to be writing in? I'll tell you what I forget. I forget what I'm living. <laughs> I remember <laughs> When I was working on the Civil War series, a little cute little Boy Scout came to my front door to sell popcorn, and I was writing him a check, and I wrote 1863 on the check. That will tell you something. But um, in all seriousness, Sorry. yes, it is difficult when I'm, thankfully, with this Chicago series, at least it has all been in the same city, but even the the culture of Chicago changes dramatically, you know, from 1871 to 1893. So how do I do it? Very carefully. And my editors do catch, catch things if I, you know, make a mistake. And, and usually the mistakes are minor, but they still would bother me, like using a word that's allowed in 1893, but not in 1871. Yeah, I just actually read a book. I was, and I think it's going to get edited out because it was an advanced reader copy. But they used a word, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that word was showed up in like the '60s, and this book was set in the 1800s. I'm like, oh, let's not. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure it'll get edited out, but I it, hope so. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate the work that you do for that. So, and I know I keep saying that. So, so we're going to wrap this up. But I have one question for you that I'd like to ask. If there's one thing you wish your readers knew about you, what is it? But because we don't know until now, we won't tell anybody else. It'll be our secret. Nothing. I'm fine. <laughs> because listen, I I knew you were going to ask that, or I knew it was a possibility. And I kid you not, I sat here like this for like seven minutes, 
trying to think of something interesting about me that I want you all to know. I can't think of any. The most interesting thing about me is what I call my packs of lies. Like I, my characters are more interesting. I'm, I feel like you probably know, you already know so much about me. I don't really know all that much about you all. And it feels a little lopsided. So I'm fine. Yeah. Well, you heard her, guys. You send her all the information about you now. She really wants you to stalk her and just send her all, you know, are you going to the doctor? Send her that. She'll love that. So, so okay, here's a funny question then. Okay. Since you're not going to, what do they, if you are with your husband who is the mayor, do they dress you, address you as Madam, Mrs. Mayor? What is the, no. They oh. do not. They do not call me Mrs. Madam or Mrs. Mayor or the First Lady of Cedar Falls or any of that. Well, you're getting gypped. <laughs> I know, right? I'm I'm actually fine with a low profile. Okay. Okay. Wait, do oh. I have a low profile? <laughs> I don't think I do have a low profile. <laughs> Neither one of us do. Our poor kids. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be those kids that oh my parents were famous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I've met your kids. They're really good kids. So I don't thank think there's going to be any worries. So. They are. So, well, thank you so much for joining us. I sure had a good time. I hope everybody else did. If nothing else, you and I, I did. Hope so. so I know I had a great time. Good, good. And I learned a lot about the, like I had said it earlier, I think I have to reread the book now that you've given all these little tidbits that I can um, pull out of it again. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate you being such an open book, no pun intended there, um, you know, for your readers. It's it's just fascinating. So so thank you very much for joining us. This was thank so fun. Thanks for having me. You bet. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if you're looking for Jocelyn's books, go to bakerbookhouse.com and look in the fiction section. They are there. I know um, White City as um, on special right now for 40% off till the end of February. So come and get it. It's free shipping. Yay. So hopefully you can join us on our next virtual tour in a couple of weeks with Cynthia Rushi. And we will talk to you then. Thank you.